بسم الله الحمد لله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يحده الله فهو المحتد ومن يضلل فلن تجد له ولي مرشدا وأشهد لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد فإن أستقى الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحديث محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدأ وكل بدأة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون So brothers inshallah this week I want to finish the lesson so I'm going to go through many of the points and these are the uh, actions that are required for al istiqama and uh, just before we begin inshallah part of the level of istiqama that we are required to have varies according to the individual so this is the level by which the person has to be firm and steadfast uh, we've already established through the lessons that obviously holding on to uh, the, the correct aqidah establishing the correct foundation pursuing knowledge which removes shak doubt eradicates jahiliyyah and ignorance and that knowledge is the kitab and the sun of the Prophet ﷺ and firm, establishing ourselves firm. This is the strongest way of all of us establishing al istiqama in this world and in the grave. And this is required upon everybody. And we start developing that firmness of identity and purpose and maqsad amongst the youngsters so that by the time they're in their youthfulness stage, then they are firm, their, de you know, their desires will be directed upon this foundation and then will become adult and mature. You will see that their level of istiqamah has to develop. Look at these four stages I have described. You know, foundation, asal, shababak, the youthful stage, the adult stage, and then the mature stage, when one becomes an adult. Four stages. And uh, for the one who is mature, Obviously for this person, he has had all this experience and so therefore their istiqamah has to be at a higher level and for them also they have a greater responsibility in terms of this, uh, uh, you know, uh, in terms of their, as a role model or as a teacher or as someone who people look towards. So when you see, and this is why, when you see the one who has ilm, the alim, who is corrupt, this is a destruction, okay, for, upon the community. When you see the elders, who also do not live according to the Kitab and the Sunnah, then this is also a destruction upon the community. Even the Prophet ﷺ said, the alim who doesn't have the adab, the alim who is corrupt, who uses their knowledge, not for the purpose of calling people to Sarat al-Mustaqim, but for their own benefit, or also to misguide people. So this is a great fitan. So part of al-istiqamah is to recognize that if we as individuals have a role being all al-amr, people of authority, then we need greater al-istiqamah to fulfill our charge. And if we look at the hadith of the Prophet كُلُّكُمْ رَائِنْ وَكُلُّكُمْ مُسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَأِيَتِهِ And he said al-amir ra'in that the one who is, everyone is in charge, everyone must fulfill their charge. Al-amir is ra'in. He is the one who is a charge, responsibility. And again, from this uh, position of all al-amr, Allah Ta'ala, how he mentions in the Quran, Ati Allah wa Ati Rasul wa Ulil Amri Minkum. Okay, in this verse, Allah Ta'ala, he says, Ati Allah, which means unconditional ita, obedience to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. As soon as this is the hukum of Allah, we accept it. Ati Rasul, unconditional acceptance of the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If someone brings you, Qala Allah, Qala Rasulullah, you cannot say if, no, or you cannot say but. All it is, sami'na wa ata'na, we hear and we obey. Ya Allah, make us of this istiqam, this firmness. But Allah did not say, wa ulil amri minkum. Well, no, Allah did not say, wa ati ulil amr. Which means, unconditionally accept the, rather Allah says, wa ulil amri minkum. Those in authority amongst us, we have to obey them. This is a very important principle. In terms of, not just, in terms of adab and in terms of mu'amalat and our general dealings. We have to obey them, but it's not unconditional. Because if the Amir is doing something contradicting Gitab and Sunnah, there is no obedience to anything if it is disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should not obey them in the Shar, in that which is evil. And there are many, many proofs. Like I said, because I've got a lot to get through, I'm not going to go through every single proof today. Now, but this principle, I think, is an important principle to establish. That brothers, we have to realize that there is, sometimes we don't accept. For a young person, it is important to learn. You accept the authority of the one who is the Amir amongst you. You do not make a khuruj or try to rebel or undermine their position. So the one in this masjid, the Imam of the masjid here, he is all in Amr. 
as I come through the door, I have to accept his, him being Amir. I can't come and say, no, he's not Amir, I am the Amir. Because this will cause fitna and facade amongst the people. So this is, if I go into it and people say, people sometimes they don't realize, they come into the masjid and they think it's the masjid. No. You respect the one who is Ulil Amr. It's also from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Adinun Nasiha, Adinun Nasiha, Adinun Nasiha. Nasiha, it means sincere, upright conduct. Who? Lillahi, Wali Gitabihi, Wali Rasulihi, Wali Immat al Muslimin, and Wali Am. So what it means is to Allah. First, your conduct is upright with regards to Allah. Then the book of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Then the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Then what, Allah, uh, what the Prophet Sallallahu said regarding the Immat al Muslimin, the scholars and leaders. That means that you have to be upright with regards to them. Don't make rebel against them. Even the Prophet ﷺ said, help your brother if he is mazloom, if he is oppressed, or if he is the zalim. And they said, we can help the mazloom, the one who is oppressed. How do we help the zalim? Obviously by trying to stop them from doing so, making dua for them. But also, you know, rebelling against them does not necessarily create a better situation. Now, again, if I walk into a shop, the one who is the Ulil Amr in the shop is the shopkeeper. Does that make sense? So what I do is, I've asked, it's almost like a contract. This is a wa'ada, this is a kind of ahad. I've gone into the shop, I accept the contract. This is your shop, I will buy your products and give you the price. I don't believe in the khuruj, I don't believe I can just go into the shop and I can take it what I want. We are just, you know, if you use the same mentality that some people use, that the one who is all in Amr is the Sheikh, is the Imam, I can just come into the masjid and I can give my own fatwa and I can make the lead the prayer and I can do. You wouldn't do this in a shop where there is a shopkeeper that you, you say, I don't accept this ahad, this contract. If you go to the, job, the GP surgery, this is another example. If you go to the GP surgery, who is all in Amr in the GP, GP surgery? Who is the one who is in authority in the GP surgery? Who? Who the authority one is? The doctor. So I don't go into the doctor and say, you are not all in Amr here. I don't accept this. I would give the... You've gone there in the first place because he is the authority. He is the one who is... The... You've accepted his authority. That means, inshallah, you have to obey him in this matter. He says, take this medicine. Unless it's against the Kitab and the Sunnah, you, 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 you should take the medicine. Otherwise, you know, don't accept his, uh, him being all in Amr. So this is an interesting principle, sometimes we don't forget. In the same, most importantly, this principle applies regarding giving of fatwa. Especially the fatwa which does concerns the general affairs of the Muslims. Very important to give this. And I always mention this story that, you know, you'll find a young brother, he's very enthusiastic. And you ask him to give you something a, a, uh, to explain one of the masail of wudu. I always say the Masail of Masa, Masa over the sock, wiping over Kufain or Jarabain. It's from Sunnah. You know, if you've put made wudu, put your socks on or your Kufain on, leather socks, you are allowed to wipe over the top of the sock, okay, for 24 hour period. So this is uh, something established. Uh, you know, what kind of Jarab? Some people say any Jarab, because the Prophet said he didn't say the type of Jarab, the type of Jarabain or Kufain, whichever. That's what he said. Even if your sock has a hole in it. Even if it has a hole, because you know the Sahaba, okay, you know, they weren't rich people. They were not rich people like us. They could go to uh, uh, Ma'lan and buy five pack of socks. No, they didn't, weren't, weren't like this. They were, they were fakir, they were poor people. They had holes in their socks. Even still, the Prophet allowed them to make masa over a sock with holes in it. Anyway, that's a, a point. Of, so, as a young brother, you ask him, give me the ruling on masa over the sock. He says, oh, I can't do this. You know, go ask the Sheikh. Go ask, you know, the Imam. I can't explain this matter. Uh, you know, you ask him something around the Masail of Janaba. Okay, what is it to be? And this is from the Fard. This is Darura knowledge. This is something you need to know about what constitutes the person who is in Janaba, who is unclean and therefore requires husl. You go, oh, you know, Akhi, I don't know. Go and ask the Sheikh. Go ask someone of knowledge. And then five minutes later, you hear the same brother saying, it is jihad here. We should fight the people there. This scholar, he is upon Batil. This system is a, a system of facade. And he's making this big, big. So what concerns him and his Rabb? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What concerns the, his, the matters of fard which are upon him? He's saying, going ask the Sheikh. But then what concerns everybody, which impacts on the lives of millions of people? He is talking freely. 
This is like, you know, he doesn't remember here. As Allah says, وَلَا تَكْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَقَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ Do not pursue that of which you have no knowledge. On this, he thinks he has ilm. The waqiya. He talks about the waqiya. What fiqh al-waqiya means? The fiqh or the understanding on the general affairs. Talks about them, but when the masail around wudu and tahara, he doesn't even know this. So this is an important point here to recognize who can give fatwa. The one who gives fatwa regarding the waqiya is one qualified to do so. The person knows the waqiya and also the person, he knows, he knows the sharia of Allah. Both of these are required. He knows what the event is taking place and he knows the kitab and the sunnah to a certain level. And obviously the bigger the, the uh, masail on the waqiya, the bigger the, the ruling on the matters of the affairs, the more senior the alim has to be. At grand mufti level. So this person is to be a mufti that the muftis respect. There are muftis who can give general fatwa, but then there are the muftis mufti. Yes, you understand as well? And the muftis mufti is the one who is qualified. Or he has to be, a, if it's finance, Islamic finance, a specialist in this way that the other muftis un, uh, understand. So this is uh, understanding the principle of all al amr. And likewise, brothers and sisters, the one who is all al amr has a responsibility, has to have a greater level of istiqamah. In the behavior of the person, we need to see that this person is stronger upon the deen of Allah Ta'ala. Because he's not only has to be firm for himself with the ilm and the knowledge that that individual has, but also has to be firm because he's the leader of his community. And the reason I wanted to talk about this is that this week, the big story this week was this Italian captain of the ship. Ya Allah, don't make us a captain like this captain. Do not make us a person who is the first to jump off the ship and let everyone die. Leave everyone else to serve. This is not leadership. This is the, not, not the one who is Olil Amr. This is the one who is okay, a coward. And because he is looking to save himself. Rather, and, and look, as for us, anfusikum wa ahlikum naru wa quduhan nasu wal hijar. Save yourself, your family from the fire whose fuel is burning stone. So for the man, the husband who is a ra'in, who is the one who is the Amir of his family, he's got to fulfill this. Don't jump the ship. Don't for, uh, forget this principle. Okay, inshallah, we continue. So last week we spoke about the importance of the sunnah in explaining the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that this is, gives us asbab al nuzul the exact precise context in which the Quran was revealed and related. And so therefore we cannot except uh, be people of istiqamah, except wa'at, as, as Allah says, wa'at asimu bihablillahi jami'un wa la tafarraku. Hold fast to the rope of Allah, do not divide. So holding on to the kitab and the sunnah prevents the ikhtilaf and the tafarraq, are splitting up into lots of different firqa and groups away from the Sirat al-Mustaqim. So we have to hold on to the book and by extension the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is why throughout the book of Allah, Allah Ta'ala, He mentions in 35 places, Ati Allah wa Ati Rasul. Obey Allah and obey the Messenger. And that what comes from it is, so this is the ita, the obedience to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as I mentioned, unconditional. Because His hukum is the hukum of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala has, a, and therefore op, uh, opposing the hukum of the Prophet is opposing the hukum. It's a simple principle and, uh, and many proofs. And Allah mentions, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُكَ فِي مَا شَجَرَ بِنُمْ ثُمَّ لَا يَجِدُ فِي أَنفُسِمْ هَرَجًا مِنْ مَقَدَيْتَ وَيُسَلِّبُ مُتَسْلِمًا And so this uh, uh, ayah of the Quran, Surah Nisa, it has a tafsir okay, based on this weak hadith. Uh, I'll explain it in a minute, but it's correct in its meaning. So we can use it as a, a way of teaching. Allah says, but know by your Lord, you are not a believer until you make the Prophet وسلم, the Hakim, the judge in your lives. And when his decision is given, you accept it. Wa yusallimu taslima, with the fullest of submission, with happiness, with gratitude. The hukum of the Prophet وسلم, is the hukum of Allah Ta'ala. You have to accept it. The, the munafiq is not prepared to do this. The munafiq does not want to accept the hukum of the Prophet وسلم, and certainly his heart is not going to be happy. Like we mentioned last week that yes, you can recite kufr on your tongue just as long as you have iman in your heart. Like Amr bin Yasir radiallahu an. That's loud. But the munafiq is the opposite. He, he, was, he claims on his lisan, on his tongue that he is a mu'min. In his heart there is no iman. So this is the opposite. So with the Muslim, you accept the hukum of the sharia. Whatever it is, so you sallim, well, you sallimu taslima, with the fullest of submission. So that well-known story of a man, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made a decision, an arbitration between a Yahud and a Muslim, Munafiq. He made a, 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 a ruling. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is just. And this is the way of our, uh, this is the way of our deen, brothers, that we stand up for justice. 
That justice is closest to piety. Every individual has a right to the to, to adil to justice. So the Prophet would arbitrate and they had the Yahud came to him and he uh, went on the side of the Yahud. He gave the ruling to the Jew. The Muslim was not happy with this ruling. So he went to Abu Bakr, Abu Bakr radiallahu an, and he says, look, can you give us a fatwa? Can you give us a ruling? When they've been to Ulil Amr, the Prophet sallallahu and he's been to the one whose who's hukam is the hukam of Allah ta'ala. And Abu Bakr says, I don't want anything to do with you. Then he goes to Umar radiallahu an, and he says, look, you know, can you give us a fatwa? You know, I've been to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, so you've been to the Prophet the Prophet has given you the ruling? He says, yes, okay, wait till I give you my decision. And as we know, the decision was, Okay, <laughs> the sword of Allah, okay, to remove the head. Now, obviously, it's a weak narration, but you know, it's correct in his kind of meaning that someone who has opposed the hukm of the Prophet, as Allah says, Let those beware who oppose the Amr of Allah and His Messenger, the command, as fitna will become upon them. This fitna is kufr, disbelief. And as a result of this disbelief, they will suffer azabun alim, great punishment. And so this is opposing the hukum of the, uh, of the Prophet ﷺ. Immediately it puts you into a state of kufr. And if this is something, obviously, the, uh, Umar, the, why the hadith is weak, okay, because the Umar radiallahu anh cannot administer the hudud without the permission of the one who is the hakim. And the, who is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? But you know that what I'm saying. He is he is one el eligible for this punishment unless he has made tawba to Allah subhanahu wa taala. Because he's immediate. You see, this is a difference. He was in the he was in the company of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and still he opposed the hukum of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this is the unconditional acceptance of of that. This is the itar. And from the itar comes principle number two. That it's not just enough that to say that we believe, except that we have to make. Ittiba. We have to then follow the example of the Prophet ﷺ practically in our lives. And again, Allah mentioned many verses. But Allah says, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِ يَحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهِ وَيَغْفِرْ لُكُمْ ذُنُوبُكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Say, if you love Allah. And Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he explained that there was a group of people, they claimed to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani al-Quraysh. They claimed to have this muhabda for Allah. So Allah Ta'ala wanted to test their love of Him. By sending the messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, "Say if you love Allah, then make ittiba of the Prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Follow him, imitate him, mold your life around his example. And as a result, Allah will love you, Allah will forgive you. Allah is ghafoor rahim. Okay, so so part of the test." of your love of Allah is to follow the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so there was one example where as a woman, she came to, uh, I think it's Ibn Masood radiallahu an, uh, and uh, she says to him, uh, again I might be mistaken there, but she asked him, I have heard that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, it is haram for a woman, the woman who plucks her eyebrows, she is cursed. And the one who plucks them from her, she is also cursed. The la'na of Allah is upon them. So this is a very serious matter. And this is, uh, you know, the curse of Allah, uh, because of, and, and it's related to changing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Likewise, also the Prophet said, tattooing, because the, uh, the Arab, the Bedouins, they used to tattoo. This is also something haram, changing the creation of Allah, and deliberately putting spaces in the teeth. So, you know, without a medical reason for doing so, because amongst the Arabs, it was a sign of beauty that there was a gap in the tooth. And there's a sign of beauty. Every culture has a different sign of beauty. Doing these things, Okay, it's haram because it's changing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anything which is similar to this also likewise is haram. He said, I have read the whole of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I have not found this in there. So that in itself shows how remarkable this woman is. She's looking, she read the book of Allah ta'ala to find. So he says, go back and read it again. She goes back, she read it again and come back. I have not found this ruling in there. So then, the, then uh, the companion he mentioned, "Wama atakum al Rasul, fakhuzuhu man hakum fantahu." Take what he gives you. Yani the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, leave that which he forbids you. And this is the essence of ittiba of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That whatever has come from him, we accept, we take it. Whatever he has told us not to do, we leave this. And there are two principles now that come, and these are important principles from the Sharia ah in relation to ibadat and what we call muamalat. It's important, brothers, uh, you know that you've understood because if we understand these principles, you understand uh, a good way of applying the religion regarding the matters of ibadat. These are the matters of prescribed ibadah, prescribed worship, 
And for something to be an act, a, 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 something which is what we call a prescribed act of ibadah, then it has to have a proof which we call qati, definite and clear proof associated with it. So for example, regarding the salah, it's an act of worship. It has a definite proof from the kitab and the sunnah. So likewise, siyam and all, all of the other, other matters. And where something that doesn't have a definite and clear proof, then sometimes you can make a kiyas or an analogy, then again, I'm not going to get kind of too technical in this matter. But regarding the matters of ibadat, the matters of prescribed worship, every matter of worship is haram, except what the Prophet ﷺ has made halal. And it's made halal from the kitab and the sunnah. I'll give you a simple example. Every way of praying Salatul Isha is haram except that the way that the Prophet ﷺ has told us. So we know for the one who is resident, there are four raka, four, four raka, uh, four, four, four Salatul Isha. So you know, this is like not five, not three. For the one who is Musafir, <coughs> there are two raka, not three or one. Or so so yeah, everything therefore in the matters of ibadah are restricted. Every way of making siyam is haram except the way that the Prophet has made halal. The opposite principle exists regarding what we call mu'amalat or general dealings, public dealings. Regarding that, everything is halal except what is made haram. So for example, the food that we are allowed to eat, all the foods are halal for us except what has been made haram. And if you look in Surah Al-Ma'idah, you know, you'll find the list of those foods which are haram for us to eat. So for example, regarding the khanzir, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Lahmahu wa dammahu, the meat and the blood, the flesh and the blood of the khanzir is haram for us. So this is it, you know, uh, uh, and so Allah ta'ala explains, and, and, and then, okay, obviously all of the other conditions I mentioned. So regarding the, uh, the food we are allowed to eat, all the food is halal, except what made haram. Another example of this is that the hairstyle, the way that we cut our hair, or if some of us, alhamdulillah, have hair left, Okay, you know, Ya Allah, all the brothers here who have hair, Ya Allah, make them have a thick head of hair, MashaAllah. Okay, so, you know, for those of us, the hairstyle that we are allowed to use, again, same principle, every hairstyle for the Muslim man is halal, except the hairstyle which has been made haram. And, and there are, in the books of hadith, there are the books on combing of the hair. And there are certain hairstyles. So the Prophet ﷺ has made it haram for the child or for the Muslim male to shave part of the head and to leave part of the head. And also how the Prophet ﷺ has said that one who does keep hair which is long, then that, that hair has to be combed and it has to be kept clean. If you cannot keep your hair clean and combed, then you need to keep it short. So this is a, again the principle regarding the mu'amalat. The general phrase, it is halal. You know, except that it is proven haram. And next principle on ittiba from Ibn Abbas, a really important principle, very important principle, which is that you can take or leave anybody's saying except the saying, and he pointed to the grave of the Prophet ﷺ, the one who is in the grave. You can take or leave anybody's saying. So whatever I'm saying, you don't have to accept it. Are you, Allah Ta'ala did not order you, unless I say, Qala Allah, Qala Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You cannot say, take, you know, any alim, any sheikh, any mufti, any peer, their qaw, their qaw, their saying, you don't have to accept it. You only accept it in accordance with, and related to that, there is a story. He says, I fear, Ibn Abbas said, I fear that stones will come down from the sky and will destroy you. That I am saying, God Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and you are saying, Abu Bakr said this and Umar said this. Even though they are Khulafa Rashidin al Mahdi, even though they are obligated to. He said, I fear you're going to be destroyed. That, you know, I'm saying this is from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and you're saying Abu Bakr said this and Umar said this. So it's important that no matter wh what the fatwa of the individual is, their own rai, own personal opinion, you don't have to follow it. You know, obviously, you know, we trust our scholars and we follow to them to the best of our ability, but fundamentally, first and foremost, Okay, you can, you, you know, we take only the saying of the Prophet ﷺ. Next point regarding uh, the ittiba and the love of the Prophet ﷺ. Next, so there's itah, ittiba, next, mahabba, mahabba. Because the Prophet ﷺ, he says, you do not truly believe until you love me more than yourself, the world, and everything in it. 
So this is important. The love of the Prophet ﷺ has to be more than everything else. And, 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 and again, because mahabba is such an important, powerful emotion. Because of love, people do all kinds of crazy things. To extreme things because of the love that they have for us, I think. For us, we have to love the Prophet. And this is from the sweetness of Iman. The sweetness of the ma Iman is that the person loves the Prophet ﷺ more than themselves, the world and everything in it. So, so again, this is, and, and, and the expression of the love, I have got time to go through all. The expression of the love of the Prophet ﷺ is to imitate his sunnah. To mention him often. To yearn to be with him in paradise. To love his Sahaba, the Ansar and the Muhajirun. To love Ahlul Bayt. To love the family of the Prophet ﷺ. To love the Qur'an because he bought Al-Qur'an. To love to make your akhlaq like the Prophet ﷺ. And to love Zuhud. To live a simple life. So these are the signs of that. And then the fourth aspect is what I've already mentioned in that. Nasiha to the Prophet ﷺ. As I mentioned in that hadith, Adinu Nasiha. He says, Wali Rasulihi. There has to be Nasiha according to Nasiha means to make your conduct in accordance with the conduct of the Prophet. So these are okay, uh, some more matters regarding the following of the Prophet. Just uh, again, as like I said, related to the subject of istiqama. So obviously holding on to the Sunnah, the Kitab and the Sunnah. But also what is important is to hold on to Khaira Ummat Ukhrijad Linas, the greatest nation. The best of the people, the people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says He is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah, yani the Sahaba, the ones that Allah ta'ala has forgiven. This whole jama'ah, this is the best nation. As the Prophet said, Khayri ummat karni, thumma lazina yilunhum, thumma lazina yilunhum. The best nation is my nation, then the one that follows it, and then the one that follows it. So the Sahaba, or radiallahu anhum, all of them, first of them to the last of them. Okay, all of them. And a Sahabi is anyone who was alive, saw the Prophet ﷺ, or if he was blind, who was in the company of the Prophet ﷺ, and died upon Iman. Over a hundred thousand of them in the Khutbah al -Wida. These are the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. They are the best nation. Because they are the ones who held, held most firmly to the Kitab and the Sunnah. As Ibn al-Qayyum, he says, he describes them as Shahidu Tanzim wa Shahidu min Hadi Rasulih al Karim. They witnessed the revelation of Allah Ta'ala and they witnessed the Hidayah, the guidance of the Prophet. This is what makes them excellent as an Ummah. This is what makes them the greatest Ummah because they were the ones who, maintained, who believed in the times of greatest difficulty. Sacrifice the most, made the first jihad, were the first du'at callers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ones who preserved the kitab and the sunnah. So the sunnah, the chain of narration for the book of Allah ta'ala and the hadith of Allah are the sahaba. They have to be the best nation because they are preserving the best ilm. And they are the ones who inherited that. If you don't, if you say as some of the people, na'uzu billah, they say that the companions of the Prophet film are the worst nation, na'uzu billah, then there is no deen left. And these are the, then they replace Sunnah with Imamah, as with the Rafida, or they replace Sunnah with their Peer and their okay, uh, Sufiya. And this is what they the people who oppose the Sunnah of the Prophet, they, what they do is they, they remove it and they replace it with their own Ta'wil, their own explanation. So, give you an example. The most prolific narrators of the hadith of the Prophet, وسلم, Abu Huraira, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al As. Aisha radiallahu anha. These are the three top narrators of the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam regarding Abu Huraira. Now, if anyone says in their heart they don't like Abu Huraira, they oppose Abu Huraira, then this is a person he is an enemy of the Sunnah, because by saying I don't accept from Abu Huraira, that's already six thousand or eight thousand hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gone. One who speaks badly of Aisha radiallahu anha, 4,000 hadith of the Prophet gone. Just like the, the Shia, this is a, and what do they, when you've got 10,000 hadith of the Prophet gone, in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, 9,000 hadith. There's 9,000 in there. You've got most of that gone. What do you replace it with? You say the Sahaba are not trustworthy. The Sunnah is not trustworthy. Although Allah Ta'ala says it is trustworthy in the Quran. You replace it with what? Our Imams. Our Imams have a direct link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's what they say, the, the Ithna Ashariya, the, the 12 Imams. They say the Imams have a direct link to God, to Allah. And this is, they are giving uh, Ilham or Wahi. They're getting this Wahi and they are the ones who can then alter the hukum of Allah. Just like the Qadianis, they say Ghulam Mirza was a Rasul Na'uzubillah. And they say because of that, he has a direct link with Allah. We don't need the Sharia anymore. We don't need the Sunnah anymore because we've got our own. Obviously, this is not... This is undermining the whole foundation of the Kitab and the Sunnah of the Prophet And likewise with the Sufiyah, they say a similar thing. They say that their, their Shaykhs 
they also have what we call hidden knowledge. They say there is the zahir and there is the batin. The zahir is the knowledge which is manifest that everyone knows. But through tariqah, you get down to the hidden ilm. The deeper understanding of knowledge. Which then means that the sharia it no longer applies to you because you have a direct link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of these are opposing the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu And replacing kitab and sunnah upon the example of the sahaba and their faham, their knowledge with obviously a different methodology and a different way. Uh, and just a final proof, because this is an improve, uh, you know, we haven't got time to go through all of this, but the final proof relating to this, <coughs> again, a verse in Surah Al-Nisa. And here Allah Ta'ala, uh, Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He mentions the path of the believers is the same as the path of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi He establishes what we call the ijma' of the Sahaba. Their agreement is also the haq, binding upon the ummah. And I mentioned the Quran, وَمَنْ يُشَاكِكِ الرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا تَبَيِّنَ لَهُ الْهُدَىٰ وَيَتَّبِعُ خَيْرَ السَّبِيلِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ نُوَلِّهِ مَا تُوَلَّ وَنُسْلِهِ جَهَنَّمُ وَصَاءَةِ مَسِيرًا Which means that if anyone opposes the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and follows a way other than that of the believers, Allah will lead them, in, uh, leave them upon the path they have chosen, land them in hell, what an evil refuge. Na'uzu Billah. So here Allah Ta'ala, He's saying, if you oppose the way of the Prophet Sallallahu following a way other than the believers, Allah will leave you upon the path, this is the path of Jahannam. So what does it mean? It means Sabeel al here is the same as the path of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. These are the same because Allah Ta'ala would not make differing with one as differing with the other. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? So who is this Sabeel al who is the part? Is it uh, the general mu'minun today? Is it us today, this sabil al mu'minina? And really, we do not fit this description of the sabil al mu'minin. Why? Because we first, you see, amongst the great ikhtilaf amongst us today, Muslims that don't even agree sometimes upon, as we said last week, Kulhu Allahu Ahad, say he's another one. So they have a different confusion about this. So how can we say that we are sabil al mu'minina? Rather, we are not sabil al mu'minina. But you know, we find there is, this sabil al mu'minina is the first ummah. Yani is the Sahaba, because they were united and firm only upon the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu And ijma, it means consensus. Now when we, when we ask people, what is the meaning of ijma? You know, I will ask brothers, what is the meaning of ijma? You, you know, the consensus in Islam. Okay, so we have uh, one brother saying that it is when all of them decide something and are in agreement upon something. Has anyone got a different view to this? Okay, that's a very good point, Mashallah. Jazakallah khair. Is those people who are really qualified, i.e., the senior scholars, when they all agree upon a matter. Anyone else? Ahmad and Mashallah both, uh, you know, very uh, correct understanding. A lot of the people when you ask them Ijma, they say the majority. The majority decision, because this is a, a democratic concept that if the majority agree, then this is a hub. I, fifty-one percent of the people agree upon something, then this is a no. This is not how we believe. For us, for us, the ijma is means full agreement. And whose agreement? Whose agreement? You see, we can all agree upon something in here, but our ilm is deficient. Whereas Olil Amr, they are agreeing upon Kitab and the Sunnah, understand it. There is a, you know, so when they, we all might agree, but uh, you know, our agreement might be battle. It might be something which is false. But when people of authority of ilm and knowledge, they are qualified to give a ruling. You know, if someone he's, he's a jahil, and they're not, we're not belittling them, we're saying the person is deficient knowledge wise, intellect wise, and understanding wise. Because he doesn't know. Their ijma is not going to be the same as one who has knowledge, understanding, and awareness of the situation. So obviously, when the scholars of Ahl Sunnah uh, agree upon a matter, don't disagree, then this is ijma. All of them agreed this is in accordance with the haq of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And because the Prophet said, my ummah will not unite upon misguidance. So to give you an example of ijma, look, the ijma of Ahl Sunnah and generally the scholars of today is that the Qadianis, they are kafir. They are, you, you know, because they oppose the, uh, uh, the Khatul al nabiyin they oppose the finality of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So even though they say the kalima in the Aqeedah, they believe there is a messenger after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So they have nullified it. There's agreement, ijma upon this of all the scholars. So even though they pray like us and fast like us, we say they are not Muslims until they make tawbah and come to our way. And if I don't agree with this, then this is also kufr to disagree with the kufr of the kufr. So this is important that we recognize it is the Sahaba's way 
And uh, we have to follow the faham, the understanding of the best of the people who were closest to this ilm. And the last proof is where the Prophet wasallam he drew a line in the sand one day, again from Ibn Masood, he says, this is the straight path. Then he drew lines left of it and right of it, opposing these ways. These were going away, diverging. He says, these are the paths of deviation. Upon the head of each of this is a shaitan uh, or a tahud. He's making that away. He's calling you to this way, away from Sirat al Mustaqim. And then he writes, right, 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 And say, this is my path, follow. Do not follow the other paths, they're going to take you away from Allah's path. He has ordered you this so that you become muttaqeen. So again, for us to hold on to the rope of Allah, to be people of istiqama, we have to have the correct aqidah, we have to have the correct knowledge, we have to follow the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. We have to have what we call the correct methodology, manhaj of Islam. And the manhaj, as Allah Ta'ala, He mentions in Surah Al-Ma'idah, لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَا مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْ حَاجَةً Very important point. To every single people, we gave them a sharia. So Allah Ta'ala gave all the different ummas sharia, law. Yahud were given the, the Torah. Okay, and the Ummah is, uh, you know, likewise Isa alayhi salam came to reaffirm the Torah. This is the law of Allah that they were given. They were given a Sharia, a law to follow. But Allah says He also gave them a manhaj. And Ibn Abbas explains, He says that there is the law, and Allah Ta'ala also made it clear what is the way to the law. He made it very clear so that you know how to derive the understanding. Because if He just gave us a Sharia, but He didn't give us the way to that Sharia, then you know, and the, Ibn Abbas explains this, he says, before this verse came down, the people were free to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala any which way they wanted. Whatever you want to do, because Allah hasn't given you a clear way. You know, so, but then when this verse came down, Allah has cut all the ways to worshiping Allah ta'ala, except the one clear way that he has shown. And so, again, this is holding on to both of these things. Okay, inshallah, we move on now to what we call the actions. And inshallah, just the next uh, half, I'm just going to go through many of these actions, inshallah, in terms of holding on to al istikama. I've already mentioned it, but just to remind ourselves, obviously, you cannot have istikama without holding on to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah ta'ala, and, uh, and those who disbelieve, they said, why, was it, why isn't this Quran sent down as one jumla, jumlatun wahid? Why isn't it just sent out in one go? Why doesn't Allah ta'ala just send the Quran, the whole of it, in one go? And then Allah Ta'ala, He replies, He says, Thus it was revealed to you to strengthen the heart. So the Quran itself is the means of strengthening the heart. And so we recite it in well arranged, uh, you know, with tartil, with, uh, in, in its sequences. It's a very important point. The revelation of the Quran, as I mentioned already, it came down in relation to particular events and situations. But not only that, it came down section upon section. And... Uh, can anyone tell me the most number of ayahs revealed in one go? Anyone tell me the most number of ayahs revealed in one go? Okay. Remember, look, this wahi, when the Prophet would receive this wahi, this would exhaust him. This is, you know, even Allah Ta'ala said, this is, you know, thaqila, was heavy. There's one occasion the Prophet <coughs> received wahi from Allah. He was upon his camel and the camel had to kneel because how heavy the wahi was. The physical strength required to receive this wahi was great. Really, you know, the, anyone who's been on a camel, I've been on a camel. I'm a big man. I'm way, 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 and I was when I sat on the camel many years ago. I was scared for the camel. <laughs> this poor animal is going to take my weight. But subhanAllah, what an amazing animal Allah has made. Strong animal. He doesn't, he doesn't, he can take, he can go through the desert with weight. But then when the wahi came and the boss was the camel, the camel had to sit down. How, I said, so of course, for, you know, the boss could not withdraw long, long, uh, uh, you know, this uh, receiving of wahi for long periods of time because it was very tough and difficult. So anyone got the number of how many ayahs the boss generally when the wahi would come? Three, okay. Sometimes, yeah, three. Okay, the most verses that the Prophet ﷺ received in one go was 10. But generally the ayat that were revealed to the Prophet ﷺ was 5 ayat at a time. 5. Okay, so this is a, you know, and, and over 23 years, 5 ayat at a time. No, only a couple of occasions it was 10. Generally, 5 ayat at a time. 
Okay, and so again, because it was heavy, and it, again, it, when the Prophet would come, it would cause him great physical exertion when the, the wahi would be received. So it is interesting that the Prophet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent it down stage after stage after stage. Why? To strengthen the heart. You know, to develop this ithbah, this firmness in the heart relating to events. So, so the people are receiving this guidance. And that's why on that occasion, when Allah Ta'ala, He revealed the verse, Al-Yawma Akmaltu Lakum Deenukum, Wa Atmamtu Alikum Ni'mati, Wa Raditu Lakum Al-Islam Adina. This day I have perfected your religion, completed my favor upon you, your way of life is Islam. When this verse was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu on Yawm Al-Arafah, between okay, Asr and Maghrib, and it was revealed, Umar radiallahu an, he became sad, the companions have become sad. They realized, and the Prophet left the world 80 days after that, that wahi. 80 days he left. And, they, and the ulama and the fuqaha, they say, between that day and the 80 days, there were no more ayat relating to ahkam, rules and regulations that were revealed. The ahkam, the rest of the Quran was revealed the general akhbar, but no more ahkam in that 80 day period, subhanAllah. They, when they received this verse, the companions have become sad. They said for 23 years, Allah has been giving this food for the soul. He's been nourishing us, strengthening our hearts. Our, yani our hearts are getting stronger and stronger and stronger by holding on to this Iman. And now it's stopped. They knew that this verse means that if Allah has completed it, it is mukammil, it's completed, it's perfected, and it is. Uh, this is your deen, al-Islam. They realized, okay, it's over. They knew now that the Prophet is going to be taken away and the wahi is going to stop. It became sad. Because they realize, you know, it cannot go on and on. You know, it has to come to an end. You know, they were, and look at that. They went from Dalal Mubin, the worst qawm on the face of the earth, to becoming Khayri Ummat Ukhrijat Linnas, the greatest nation raised up from my time. Because they were, they, they were, their soul was fed with the ayat of Allah. So, uh, so this is why it's sent down five ayat at a time in relation to this. And this is why when we recite it, we recite it with this tartil, in this slowly measured rhythm. And this is why also the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, and we know the hadith of Ibn Umar, that when they used to learn the Qur'an, how many ayat at a time did they learn? No, 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 no. Yeah, no. Ibn Umar says ten ayat at a time. Ten at a time. Because this was, a, remember, this is the maximum. Number was ten. So again, they say ten ayat at a time. This is what they would learn. Following this methodology of the Prophet. And then they said, we would learn it, we would study it, the halal, the haram, what is required to know, what is not required to know. We would not move on until we had learned the ten. And put this into amal, and put the into action as well. So, number one, uh, study of the Quran. Number two, uh, is again sticking to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doing the good deeds okay and uh, just in particular I wanted to uh, mention one very beautiful verse of the Quran which relates to this uh, matter of sticking to the law of Allah obviously brothers it's not uh, not enough and uh, this this in very much states the offer it is not enough that we just have the knowledge and we do not put the knowledge into practice rather the knowledge has to be beautified as well with amal uh, and i mentioned the verse before you dunya wa fil akhirah allah ta'ala will establish you with a call which is strong for those people in this world and in the hereafter so the more our amal is in accordance with the book of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the more it is okay then the more allah ta'ala he, strength, uh, he strengthens us in in this matter so you just find the particular verse this Okay, now brothers, this verse, okay, when we're talking about the knowledge and then putting the knowledge into practice, uh, and if anyone asks you for a verse of the Quran which explains the whole of the reality of Islam, this one verse is so comprehensive. It's in Surah Al Baqarah, ayah number 177. This one verse explains everything. If someone asks you, a uh, majlis, oh, can you choose an ayah of Quran? For us to give some hidayah. So you know, begin the majlis with the recitation of the book of Allah. And you can't think of an ayah. Think of this, ayah 177 in Surah Al-Baqarah. It explains everything. So Allah Ta'ala, he mentions, لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّوا وَجُوهَكُمْ كِبْلَ الْمَشْرِكَ وَالْمَغْرِبِ وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَالْمَلَائِكَةَ وَالْكِتَابَ وَالنَّبِيِّينَ وَآتَ الْمَالَ عَلَى حُبِّهِ ذَوِ الْقُرْبَ وَالْيَتَابَ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَابْنِ السَّبِيلِ وَالصَّائِلِينَ وَالْفِرْقَابُ وَأَكَمَ الصَّلَحِ وَأَتَ الزَّكَحِ وَالْمُوفُونَ بِأَحْدِهِمْ إِذَا أَحَدُوا وَالصَّابِلِينَ فِي الْبَأْسَاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَهِينَ الْبَأْسِ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ الصَّدَقُوا وَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُتَّقُونَ So this is a very beautiful verse of the Quran. Here Allah Ta'ala he mentions it is not birr, goodness, 
that you just turn your face to the east or to the west. So this is a very important point here. Allah Ta'ala, he begins, لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَجُوهُ وَجُوهُ وَجُوهَكُمْ كِبْلَ الْمَشْرِكِ وَالْمَغْرَبِ It's not that you just turn your face. Yani, ibadah, bear goodness, isn't that you just on the outside show that this is Iman. That on the outside we look as a Muslim, but rather as Hassan al-Basri, rahimahullah, he said, Iman is what is in the heart and it is demonstrated by the hasanat, the good actions. It's in the heart and demonstrated by the good actions. He says, do not just wear Islam as a libas, as a garment. I'm wearing it as a dress today and then you take off the dress. No. So Allah Ta'ala is criticizing here Yahud and Nasara for what they call their empty ibadah. They will engage in the worship on the outside, but there's nothing in their heart. So Allah says, bir is to believe in Allah. Wal yawmil akhir. And the day of judgment. Wal malaika, wal kitab, wal nabi'een. And look at the order. The day of judgment. Then the Malaika, because Jibra'il alayhi salam gives the Gitab to the Nabi. So there's a particular ordering of this. That's why, you know, to believe in the angels, the books, and the messengers. So the so first part of Iman, is, the first part of Islam is sincere Iman, uh, you know, in, in Allah and obviously the other principles of that. And then after you have sincere Iman, Allah says, وَآتَ الْمَالِ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ ذَوَ الْقُرْبَ وَالْيَتَامَ وَالْمَسَاكِينَ وَبْلِسْسَبِيلِ And then he spends his wealth. You sacrifice your wealth in spite of your love for it. You love your wealth, but you give it to the uh, the one who is Karib, to your family, to the Masa to the orphans and to the poor and to the and to the one who is وَبْلِسْسَبِيلِ The traveler, the homeless person. And you set free the one who is a slave. So the one who is in slavery, we remove them from the slavery. So therefore Allah Ta'ala, He requires, okay, what we call Al-Birr to the makhluk, to the creation. So Imam Shafi'i Rahimullah, He explained Islam. He says, if you want, He said, Islam is to believe in Allah and to do Al-Birr to the makhluk, to do goodness to the creation. Of Allah Ta'ala. Simple explanation. I want to ask you, what is Islam? To believe in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and to do good to the creation. Okay, because, uh, you know, we have to show that Iman that we have in Allah in terms of how we de de deal with that. So, Al-Bir, goodness to Allah and goodness to the creation. Then Allah Ta'ala, after that, He says, Wa'akim as-salah, then Allah Ta'ala, and to give the zakah, and wal-mufuna bi ahadihim idha ahadu, and those people who give, uh, pray, and obviously prayer is the most important act of worship. First one to be revealed. The prayer was revealed where, brothers? When this ahkam was given to the Prophet Wasallam, where was it given? The, when it was far established, where? Yeah, it was given in the Miraj. When the Prophet Wasallam went on the night journey, the Isra, and then the uh, ascendance, the Miraj. What is the Miraj? The Miraj is like an escalator, that's how it's described, going through the heavens. And as he's going on this journey with Jibreel alayhi salam, just to give you an idea, it's an amazing journey when he went with Jibreel alayhi salam, all in the hadith of the Prophet Okay, they come to Sidratul Muntaha. Sidratul Muntaha is the low tree. This is the furthest point in our universe, you could say, in the Sama. To give you an idea of the Sama, how vast this creation is of Allah Ta'ala. That's why Allah says, look at it. You won't find any imperfection. Look at it again, you won't find any imperfection in what Allah. You know, brothers, when you look up at the sky tonight and you see all the stars, this is just the first sama, first heaven. How vast is that? Just the first sama. And there are six more on top of it. Between each of them is a travel of distance of travel 50,000 years. 50,000 years. That's how great this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. Above the seven heavens then is the water. And above the water is the, uh, uh, what is it, uh, the kursi. And above the kursi is the arsh of Allah. And above that, istiwa ala al-arsh is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? In a way which is befitting of His Majesty. And just to give you an idea, I just like the vastness of this creation. The, the sama'a in relation to the kursi. And the Prophet said, this is like a ring thrown into the desert. You take a ring, you throw it into the desert, what happens? Lost. It gets lost. He says, the sama'a in relation to the kursi of Allah. And look what Allah says, you know, that the, that the kursi is above the heavens and the earth. It transcends the heavens and the earth. Again, how befitting of Allah. And so the, this is how the, the heavens are in relation to the kursi of Allah. Yani, 
And then he says, the Qursi in relation to the Arsh is like a ring thrown into the desert. You can't even imagine how great Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is istiwa ala al-arsh established in a way befitting of him. I love that. Yani Allah is separate from the creation. This is how vast the creation. And Sidrat al-Muntaha is the furthest place in the universe. He went with it. And then Jibra'il alayhi salam says to the Prophet I can't go beyond this point. If I go beyond this point, I am destroyed. And the Prophet then went beyond this. Before the arsh of Allah ta'ala, Although, you know, he just went, as he described, I went through layer upon layer of light upon light. He didn't see, obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he's before the presence of Rabbil Alameen, and he is ordered with Akim is Salah. <laughs> Establish the prayer. That's how important the Salah is. And also the Salah is, of, you know, pray part of the night. This Qiyam al part of the night is from the foundations of strengthening Al-Iman. So, you know, so then we have the formal acts of worship. And then Allah Ta'ala says, وَالصَّابِرِينَ فِي الْبَأَسَاءِ وَالْدَرَّاءِ وَهِنَ الْبَأَسِ And those people who have sabr in times of hardship, in times of distress, and in times of difficulty, such are the ones who are Siddiq, and such are the ones who are Muttaqeen. So this verse, one verse establishes the overall the importance of uh, and, and, and the pillars of Iman as well. So stick to the law of Allah. Number three, Istiqama. I've mentioned about the uh, the best of the people. The best people who Allah Ta'ala put on the earth are the Anbiya and the Rasul. They are the best hearts. And Allah Ta'ala has given us their qasas, their stories. And Allah, and He says, and we relate to you, on, we, and we relate unto you the stories of the messengers in order that you may find firmness in your heart. So the qasas and Anbiya brothers are very important. They, when you look at all of the respective Anbiya, they were in different events, different situations, different challenges. All of them had sabr, istiqamah, tawakkal, the best of the qualities. And this is why we look at their stories to inspire us. And in each of their stories, there is something for every insan on the face of this earth. And I, in particular, I always say to the mothers in particular, bring your children up on the stories of the Anbiya, on these stories, because these are the stories which they will, the children will remember. All of their lives, when you tell them the story of Nuh alayhi salam and the story of Ibrahim alayhi salam and the story of the, the Adha, the sacrifice and the story of Suleiman and all of the Anbiya and the Rasul, when you tell them these stories, they will remember them. So bring up your children upon the best of the stories. The story of, you know, and some of the messengers, they were kings. They were prophet kings like Suleiman alayhi salam. He was a wealthy rich man, given all this wealth and power. Yeah, and, Nabi, and so we learn from this how to be Malik al-Adl, a just king. Dawood alayhi salam was a king as well. Whereas the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he chose to be an Abd and a Rasul. Either you were a Malik and a Nabi or an Abd or a Rasul. So the Prophet chose to be a slave and a messenger of Allah, okay, uh, rather than a prophet or a king. Look at the example of Yusuf alayhi salam. He's an example to the Shabab, to the young people. But I say, look how amazing is the example of Yusuf alayhi salam. He was persecuted. He was in Guantanamo, you could say, <laughs> you know, in prison. He was his brothers, they tried to kill him. He sold as a slave. So much zulm he's done to him. And he's in the prison in Misr. Not like a prison here where you get Sky TV. This is a prison in Egypt, which you can imagine. And in the prison, look at this brother, subhanAllah. Look at the quality of a person. It doesn't change. You got you this istiqamah like in the prison. The prisoners are coming to Yusuf alayhi salam for nasiha. For, he's a young man, but they're coming to him for guidance, i.e., in terms of the interpretation of the ruhya of the dreams. And then when they ask, why is it? Because we know that you are from al muttaqin because you are a person of taqwa and you are salihin. That's why they are coming to him for guidance. That's what made him ulil amr in the prison. He is the leader, and he is given leadership. You know, and then he advises, as we know, one of the people of the, of the court of the Malik, of the king. He says, if I come out, don't really forget me. So he says, again, strategy, ilm, wisdom. Don't, don't forget me when I come out. Anyway, so, you know, the story goes, eventually, look at this. Yusuf alayhi salam, he is rewarded for his sabr. As they was sabrina fil ba'asai wa dharai wa hinal ba'as. The sabr in the time of hardship, musiba, and difficulty. He's re rewarded for this. How? Eventually he becomes the advisor of the Malik himself. And look at that, he's an advisor in the land of shirk. He's a land, these are disbelievers. He's an advisor in this land. He's a wazir in this particular land. So again, so many lessons you learn from the story of Yusuf. And then when it comes to his family, he forgives his brothers. So again, we, we learn. So these are the stories, the Qasas al-Anbiya is important for us.
Number four, sticking uh, 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 al-istiqama is, brothers, it is so important. We make dua that Allah Ta'ala, He keeps our heart firm. Uh, I mentioned one of the dua, most frequent dua that the Prophet Sallallahu would make was, Ya Mukallib al qalub thabbit qalbi ala deenik. Oh, the one with the control of my heart, keep my heart firm upon this religion. Similar, you know, the other dua, رَبَّنَا لَا تُوزِ قُلُوبَنَا بَعْدَ إِذْ حَلَيْتِنَا وَحَبْ لَنَا بِلَّدُنْكُ رَحْمَةً إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْوَحَبُ Oh Allah, do not let my heart deviate after you've guided me and you have had rahm upon me. Okay, and truly you are from those who are al-wahab, the one who bestows. So brothers, make dua, Allah keeps you upon us istiqamah and keeps you upon the religion. Make this dua frequently. The Anbiya and the Rasul, they make this dua. So you should be making this dua as well. And regarding the dua, there is a mannerism in dua. It's important to recognize how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, okay, وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ مُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ Call on me and I will answer your prayer. So this is important here. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He explained, every dua that we make, brothers, sisters, every dua, Allah will answer every single dua that we make, except the dua that is made by someone in whose heart there is not yaqeen and there is no iman. So you're making this dua, Allah's not gonna oh, oh Allah's not gonna answer this dua. No, the Prophet ﷺ said this every Allah says, Call on me, I will answer your prayer. So you make sincere wasila to Allah. Last week we mentioned about the manners of wasila. You make dua to Allah, Allah will answer your dua. And he it's done in three ways. It's either answered there and then, as you have asked for it. And as we know, there are best times to make dua like Yawm al-Arafah. And there are times, uh, you know, I, I remember when I went on Hajj 2001, I made dua, Ya Allah, give me a son who will be an alim and a da'i. And then Yaqub was born after that. <laughs> but now I have met my new, my new son, I'm sure I'm going call him Musa. So maybe it's him now, Wallahu alam. <laughs> okay. So Allah answers it there and then, you know. Or Allah Ta'ala gives you something which is equivalent to that dua. Equivalent, something similar to it. Or it's saved up for the yawm, uh, on Yawm Al-Qiyamah in terms of your shifa on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, your intercession on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. So each dua is answered there and then. However, again, the conditions have to be fulfilled. There's an example, there's a hadith of the Prophet, there's a man, he's by the roadside, raising his hands to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he's begging Allah ta'ala. And the Prophet said, his jism is haram, his rizq is haram, his clothes are haram. Yani, everything this person is doing is haram. And yet, how, how will his dua be answered when he hasn't purified himself? And so again, this is about your own hasanat, your closeness to Allah Ta'ala in terms of the answering of that dua as well. And there's a very beautiful saying of one of the scholars of the past, Ibrahim ibn Adhan. He makes a long, long say. He says, you make, the, he's asked, you know, call on me, I will answer your prayers. Why is it Allah doesn't answer our dua today? And he explained it very simply. He went through a list. He says, you see, you bury your dead, you don't take any lesson from it. You know, you read the book of Allah, you ignore the book of Allah. You have the sunnah of the Prophet and you turn away. You worship Allah with no real iman in your heart. And he goes through this whole list. How can you expect your dua to be answered when our iman itself is something which is, is, is weak and is something which is def deficient? Okay, next in terms of ithbat and firmness is dhikr of Allah. As, and many verses of the Quran where Allah, tell, Allah talks about the importance of dhikr and Allah says, وَذَكْرَ اللَّهِ كَثِيرًا And make a dhikr often. And so this remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as often as we can. Remember, and this dhikr is upon the way that the Prophet sallallahu has shown us to make dhikr. Small things that are heavy on the scale, such as subhanallah wa bihamdihi, just that. And to recite the, obviously the best azkar, obviously the kalima, la ilaha illallah. And obviously everything from Al-Quran and the masnoon du'as. And so again, this, this remembrance of Allah through du'a and through this just general azkar and remembrance through, through the day. It's something which should be moist on the tongue. The remembrance of Allah. And the proof of this, one of the ways is that next time you hit your foot against the table, you see, think about what comes out of your tongue. Just think about what comes out of your tongue. This is an example of whether your tongue was akrallahi kathira. Okay, and uh, how Allah Ta'ala mentions, you know, that those people who make dhikr often, this is, okay, part of the success of the individual as well. Next, tawakkal in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and trust in Allah and tr trust in the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so the first is the, the trust in Islam. Brothers, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has explained to us, this deen will be victorious. 
And Allah Ta'ala, He talks about whether, you know, Allah Ta'ala has told us, ذَلِكَ الْفَوْزُ الْكَبِيرِ فَوْزُ الْعَظِيمِ Al-Fawz, victory and success. Guaranteed for those people upon Iman and Amul and Salih. So this deen will succeed. In the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one day, Khabab radiallahu anhu, he was a companion who was tortured in Makkah. He came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, Make dua. And the Prophet was reclining upon the Kaaba with his uh, uh, cloaker. And he says, Just make dua, Allah Ta'ala. He makes our situation better. Make dua. He wasn't complaining. He wasn't, you know. And then the Prophet said, This deen will succeed. So much so that a rider can ride from Sana to Hadramut, one end of Yemen to the other. He says, With no fear. Except that the fear that the sheep have for the wolf, you know, the natural khuf, no fear whatsoever, complete safety and security. He says, this deen will be victorious. In other hadith, Islam will enter into every single dwelling, be it made of cloth, be it made of fur, be it made of clay, brick. Islam will enter into every single dwelling. He says, there was also a people before you and a person would be taken and a, a, a comb of iron would be used to rip the flesh from his body who would not give up his religion. And a pit would be dug and a fire would be lit and the believers would be thrown into the fire and they would not give up their religion. Then the Ashab al-Ukhdud. And from the miracles of, bestowed upon Ashab al-Ukhdud, there is a mother and she's waiting to be thrown into the fire. Okay, and, uh, and her ch child is there and her heart is wavering. Her heart is trembling because she fears for her child. Allah Ta'ala calls the child to speak to her. Ya Ummi, Isbiru, O mother have sabr. Remain firm upon this. And then both of them thrown into the fire and this became coolness and paradise. Ya Allah, give us this istiqamah, this level of firmness, you know, subhanAllah. That a mother is so much concerned for the safety of her child. On Yom Al-Qiyamah, she'll throw her child in the fire to save herself. But on this world, she wants to, to save herself. So this deen will succeed. And then he said to uh, Khabab, okay, وَلَكِنَّكُمْ تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ But you people are impatient. Have ajila, this impatient. You want everything quickly and, and now. Even though Khabab, he's not complaining. And he was tortured and he had suffered with the torture. Even he said, he said, You people are impatient people. Brothers, the help of victory, the victory of Allah is qareeb. It's always close. The thing which makes it further and further away is not having sabr upon the deen of Allah Ta'ala. This is the lesson from uh, the battle of Uhud as well. And Allah Ta'ala, He mentions, He has sent His messenger with the religion of the truth that it will become victorious over all of the other religions, even though the mushrikun detest it. This religion will succeed. The Prophet Sallallahu and his companions saw it in their time. They conquered the world. They conquered Rome and Persia. Okay, so they saw the victory of Al-Islam. So trust in Islam always. Allah has given you deen of help. And trust that the help of Allah Ta'ala will come. And so whenever, look, with every single messenger, you know, uh, and this is, uh, unfortunately I haven't got it, but when you read the story of David and Goliath, read this story. Okay, and the dua at the end of it, the companions of Talut, they made this dua. Rabbana afdil alina sabran wa thabbit akdamana wa nsunna lal qamil kafirin. That's right, yeah. You know, this is the dua that they made. Oh Allah, okay, you know, give us this uh, firmness, you know, give us your help, uh, give us ithbat, make our foothold strong, give us help against the disbelieving folk. And the story it goes, all of their eyes which reveal it. The Yahud, they say, Bani Israel, say to the king, give us a king and we want to fight jihad. And then I says, don't ask for something that you're not ready for. It's important, don't ask. And so when it, then they're given a king, they complain, Talut is not good enough. He's not a person of, uh, of, of position, of wealth. They rejected the, the king that Allah has given. When remember, Allah is Malikul Mulk and he is the one who establishes Malkiyah, the kingdom upon this earth. He's the one who chooses your king for you. Say so they rejected him in the first place. And then when they got the army ready for jihad, the people who said it, that he weren't ready for it. And then he says, you know, even though Allah Ta'ala sent down at tabut clear ayat for them to see. They still didn't accept it. So the army got smaller and smaller. And then they disobeyed the hukum of Talut. And then by the time they were, the army was actually assembled. The ones facing, okay, Jalut. Okay, they, you know, the wise ones amongst them said, how often a small group of people defeated a great group of people? Because they have what? Al-Iman. True belief. Firm conviction. Trust in Allah. Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal waqeel. That whenever there's an army in front of you, you the Iman would grow even more because they put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have our 313. 
We have 313 people who, uh, the, you know, people who showed this when they fought against the Tawhud in Al Badr. And Al Badr, the 313, likewise, you know, rather small group of people defo- defeated a big army. If you look at the early history of the Muslims, they were always outnumbered, but they have the strongest requirement the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which comes as a result of Iman, Sabr, and Taqwa. And so the point of Badr, I always say, one of the important lessons from Badr is that everyone in their life, they have the Badr moment. The Badr moment. Everyone will have it. Where it comes a time where it's not enough just to say, but you have to really stand up for Deen al-Haq. Put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it's da'wah, whether it's sacrifice, or whatever. I'm not talking about jihad or fighting here. No, brother, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about making your effort for the sake of Allah ta'ala. And finally, number 10 from the, this particular list uh, is that the number 10 point is knowing the reality of falsehood and not being deceived by it. This dunya is nothing other than mata'ul ghurur, a deception. It looks good. How the Prophet ﷺ, he said the likeness of this dunya is like the best food and the best drink. Its end point is disgusting to us. How it ends up is najis. That's how it ends up. You know, you get that lovely pizza. You know, when you get the nice big pizza, all the slices, it smells good, it looks good. What does it come out as? It comes out as something which is najas. Because this is a dunya, the likeness of a dunya. It is beautiful and uh, glittering, and it is, has this beauty to it, but its end product is where real existence is in. So do not become de- dest- uh, defeated and do not become corrupted. Okay, and deceived by this falsehood. And remember, shaitan's object is to make it beautiful and alluring to you. He is aduwum mudeen. He is your plain enemy. So take him as your enemy. Allah Ta'ala, he tells him, he, is, he tells, he says, you know, the shaitan, you know, in the shaitan, lakum adu, verily shaitan is your enemy. Fattakizuhu aduwa. So take him as your enemy. So Allah Ta'ala tells us the problem and the solution. He is your enemy. Take him as your enemy. He's not your enemy, take him as your friend, your associate, the one who gives you nasiha. Don't do that. Do, you know, so to, to recognize that. So don't be deceived by this world and what this world uh, has. Uh, and a few more points, inshallah, then we finish, finish as well. I'll go from next number seven, al tazkiya tazkiya because the Prophet ﷺ came, وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ To purify the people. And tazkiya means what? Tazkiya tun nafus, it is that one, he is... There is a quality of the one who has the pure soul, qalbi salim, the sound heart. <coughs> From these qualities is the person is quick in making tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he keeps, he wants to keep away from the ma'asi. He's purifying his heart to keep away from the sin. To develop what we call nafsin mutma'innah. The soul which is always returning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The soul which is content and happy. That's what I say is, you know, regarding this state of the soul, mutma'innah. Means satisfied and content. Whatever Allah has given me, Alhamdulillah, sabr and shukr. Ajab al amr al-mu'min. This wonderful is the life of a believer. We completely accept whatever Allah has given. This is the pure uh, contented heart. I saw a survey this week in, in the paper about where are the happiest people in the world. So a global survey. The happiest people in the world and the least happy people in the world. And so we looked at the countries which are least happy, where the people themselves were not happy. They don't have contentment, sakina. They don't have sakina. They don't have. Ha- and it was all the way from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, okay, uh, Gulf, all across the Maghrib, all of the uh, North Africa. Yet all of the Muslim countries, they were saying they're least happy. The happiest countries, the people who were saying they're the happiest in the world, all the way through Africa, sub Saharan Africa. These are the poorest people in the world. Ajib. How ajib is this? The ones who Allah has given us deen of haqq who should be mutma'inna, satisfied with Allah, they're saying they're not happy. Whereas the people Allah has given the least to, they live in absolute poverty and hardship, they're saying that they're happy, subhanAllah. And I won't go through when I went to Uganda, when I saw this, how the quality of the people, they had this quality of accepting whatever Allah has given them and being happy with that, you know, subhanAllah. Whereas, uh, you know, for us, and, and the reason for this lack of happiness is wahan, as the Prophet ﷺ said, wahan. Hubba dunya wa karahiyatul maut, love of this world and hatred for death. Hatred for, yani what this means is, of course we hate death, but what we do is that fear of facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the point of the, the tazkiyah, as the Prophet said, tazkiyah is to purify the heart. The, the Prophet's heart was the purest heart. And he has told us how to clean our hearts. 
following his example uh, and uh, and to make this tazkiyat al-nafus to purify the soul purify and, and just to quickly the three poisons the eyes looking at something without r- 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 uh, lowering the gaze the lisan talking too much without the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the stomach eating too much and I've got to say, brothers, just on Tib Nabawiyya, the medicine of the Prophet most of the diseases, both in terms of the ruh and of the jism, are from eating too much. That goes into the stomach. Most of them, 80% of the problems are eating too much. The alaj is very clear. One third, one third, one third is given the alaj in terms of how to eat. Most of the problems, as in, and uh, Tib Nabawiyya, written by Ibn al qayyum he talks about a really important principle. Most people, they eat when they're not even hungry. As a result of this, the digestive tract, it gets completely congested with food. There's no break at all in the digestive tract. As a result of that, the food gets stuck in that area. The bacteria increase is called putrefaction, fermentation. You get bloated, you get more, you feel uncomfortable. It takes away all of your energy. And because of all of the bacteria which is there, it causes so many of the problems which occur with the liver and the intestines and all of these things. It's, subhanAllah, and that's why we're told one third food, one third water, one third air. Don't, and then don't eat until you are hungry again. So this food has moved through your digestive pattern. You're not putting food upon food upon. Does that make sense to everyone? This is, you know, subhanAllah, what is explained in Tib Nabawiya, the medicine of the Prophet Sallallahu just to, and, and to, to control the diet. So three poisons of, of the heart. And then another poison of the heart, obviously, is our friends and the companions that we keep. Very important. That for us, if we want to be upon istikama, keep your friends who are muttaqeen and salihin. Very important. The hadith of Prophet about the good companion is like the one who sells misk. The least that you're going to get is to be able to smell the perfume. But you might get a bit of a freebie. He might give you something free, inshallah. Okay, this is a good companion. Although, and the bad companion is like the the blacksmith. Not that that is a bad person, but from the least that you're going to get is you're going to smell the smoke and you're going to feel the heat. But you might get burned by having this companion. So, tazkiyah is about purification of the heart, holding the soul to account. And finally, as Umar, uh, uh, Umar ibn al Khattab, he mentioned, okay, take account of yourself, make this muhasiba. Take account of yourself before Allah takes account of you on your al-qiyamah. Weigh your a'mal before Allah weighs your a'mal on your al-qiyamah. So this is part of al tazkiyah And finally, as the Prophet ﷺ said regarding tazkiyah, Kun fi dunya ka'annaka gari, aw abil as which means that live in this world like you are a traveler, like a ghuraba, like someone who's traveling, and that, you know, uh, uh, you're going to complete your journey and move uh, along. So the one who is a ghuraba, traveling, only take what you need. The, and, uh, and I'll finish with this last uh, story. In the Prophet Sallallahu he said, he would sleep uh, on, the, on the ground on a bed made of sticks and leaves. It would leave an imprint upon his body when he would sleep upon this bed. <laughs> Umar radiallahu anhu seeing this, he says, Ya Rasulullah, let us put a soft bed down for you. Soft bed, that you don't have this. They were so distressed to see this. And the Prophet said, no, I have nothing to do with this world. I'm just like a rider who is rested. And under a tree, I will wake up and continue my journey. This is Yani, our whole life on this earth is just like that little rest. That kekula that we take. That's that little rest in the afternoon. That's it. Brothers, to give you an idea, this carpet that we are sitting on is, was, is more comfortable than the bed that the Prophet used to sleep on. This carpet. The Prophet never even had something as soft as this. And, uh, and when he left this world, his family, they were destitute. They had nothing. Even his family had no food in their houses. This is the Prophet ﷺ who all of the wealth, the man after of Arabia was presented at his feet. But give, he, he is a person who had nothing to do to this. And this is from al tazkiyah to leave this dunya, to do it sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, fortunately, the last two points, inshallah, I wanted to talk about was brotherhood and uh, al-islah. Inshallah, we'll leave them hopefully for another opportunity, inshallah. Brothers, we make dua, Ya Allah, you know, the guidance that we have, inshallah, hopefully it wakes up our hearts. We ask Allah Ta'ala to truly make us people who stand firm upon our religion, upon our aqidah, and in terms of calling people to that. And we ask Allah Ta'ala to make our youth and our children lil muttaqina imama. Brothers, any questions, inshallah, before we close today?
Okay, the fard knowledge, which is upon every single Muslim, is the knowledge which is uh, uh, is the knowledge which allows us to practice what we could call the five pillars of Islam. Okay, shahada, salah, zakat, siyam, and hajj. Those things which enable us to fulfill those things which are obligatory upon us. That is the knowledge which is the knowledge which is what we call a dorura, a necessity for us to gain. So the knowledge of the five pillars, the knowledge of the, of the six pillars of Iman. Obviously, uh, you know, and also the knowledge which enables us to stick to the halal away from the haram. The, you know, so these are what we call the knowledge which is obligatory. So, for example, it's obligatory for a Muslim to know that alcohol is haram. Okay, and keep how to keep away from, from that. So, this is what we call the asur or the foundation knowledge. Outside of that, the, the knowledge which is more specialist, Muslim isn't required to have this knowledge. And there's a well-known hadith of the Prophet where a man came to the, uh, uh, the Prophet and said, I will obviously pray, fast give my zakah and perform my hajj, I will do no more and no less. Although this is what the Badud is where Bedouin who came to the Prophet you know, and some people say, you know, if this is your level, then it is. So the Prophet, and the Prophet said, this is enough. So just for that person to fulfill the fard, the five obligatory duties to do, to be able to fulfill that, uh, uh, you know, no more, no less, that is the basic requirement. Of Muslim. I'll give you another example that for a Muslim, you know, uh, a Muslim is required to know a certain level of Arabic. Whether you are a convert to Islam or you know, born Muslim, you have to know Arabic. And but that doesn't mean you need to know all Lughat al Arabiya. What it means is that you need to know the necessity parts of it. So, for example, a Muslim should know the Shahada. Yes, the Muslim should know Assalamu alaikum. Muslim should know the bis the Basmalah. Then the Muslim should know Surah al Fatiha. And the Muslim should know the matters in the Salah because these are obviously fard. So once those that that dorura, that requirement is met, then the person isn't required to know about conversational Arabic and other things because he has the basic requirement in Arab, which is enough for him or her to practice the religion, inshallah. Okay, brothers, Jazakallah khair, inshallah, for attending. Alhamdulillah. I know I talk a lot, brothers. <laughs> I'm sorry for this, but inshallah. You know, uh, it's because obviously this is something I enjoy talking about as well. So inshallah, jazakallah khair. Allahu alam subhanaka alhamdulillah. 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 Alhamdulillah.